But having said that, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. We're going to be looking at verses 57 through 68. In a message I'm calling the King's Trial, we could just as easily have called it the King on Trial, but we could have just as easily have called it us on trial, me on trial. Because the trial of Jesus isn't just about a trial of Jesus. It's about the trial that each and every one of us must also embrace. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Also, it's the first uh, Sunday, and it's our custom, if you will, to have communion. And so a little bit later on, we're going to have communion. We have what's called an open communion. If you're a believer, if you know and love and believe in the Lord Jesus, you are absolutely welcome to partake in communion with us. If that's not you, if you're not a person who doesn't know and love him, then we would ask you to refrain from taking communion. But we're hoping, and I'm hoping, before the end of the service that that will be you. That you'll be that person who goes, no, I, I want to know and I want to love and I want to, to embrace Jesus as my Lord and Savior. The King's Trial, Matthew 26, verses 57 through 68. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we commit this morning to you our worship and our heart. Lord, I pray again that you will open up our heart and our minds. Lord, I pray that now, like a laser, we will be able to focus on this passage. Lord, we pray for understanding. Lord, we pray that we wouldn't be content to just simply read the words and have them escape the application of our life. And so, Lord, with this new year, Lord, we pray that we could walk in the direction that you've called us to, a life of love, a life of holiness, a life of humility, that in humility and holiness and sacrifice, we'll find ourselves closer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 57. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. And he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is this these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? We're immediately overwhelmed by the injustice of what we've just read. Most cultures value 
justice. They value the rule of law. Our English word justice comes from the meaning of a Latin word, ustitia, which means the law um, or the administration of the law. Now we come to the trial of Jesus. There are six components to the arrest and the trial of Jesus. In order for you to understand what the New Testament says about this, let me try and help you think about these, these elements and briefly outline them. Number one, there was the arrest. You'll remember that that took place on the evening of the Passover in the Garden of Gethsemane. We looked at that when we looked at the previous study in Matthew chapter 26, verses 47 through 56. You'll remember that Jesus is arrested in the garden. By the way, what was he charged with? There were no charges. There were no charges. No charges are given. Now, again, that's unusual in and of itself. When you think about it, usually when a person is arrested, you get to say, what are the charges? Number two, Jesus was brought first to Annas in John 18, 24. And then he's brought to this group assembled at the house of Caiaphas. This group consists of Annas, Caiaphas, and an incomplete assembly of the scribes and the elders. This group consisted of a, of a kind of grand jury to determine if Jesus should be indicted for crimes. Number three, Jesus would then be brought before the full body of the Sanhedrin at daybreak. We, we find that in Matthew chapter 27, verse 1, when we just turn the page, when it says, when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the, of the people plot against him. And again, it's recorded in Luke chapter 22, verse 66. This full body of governors, judges, administrators, they constitute a kind of Jewish Supreme Court. Number four, Jesus is then brought before Pontius Pilate, the procurator, the Roman governor of the province. When Pilate discovers that Jesus is from the Galilee, he sends him to Herod Antipas. Number five, Herod Antipas is the official who had earlier killed John the Baptist. He happened to be in Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover where he kept a royal home. And when you think about him keeping a royal home, think of it more in terms of a consulate. In other words, he is um, an administrator of a particular, particular region, but when he happens to be in Jerusalem, he retains this particular royal home where he can entertain guests and make decisions. Luke's gospel records that event in Luke chapter 23, verses 8 through 10. And this is one of the times where the Living Bible gives um, a simple but vivid picture of what took place at that point. It says Herod was delighted at the opportunity to see Jesus. For he had heard a lot about him. And he'd been hoping to see him perform a miracle. He asked Jesus question after question. But there was no reply. Meanwhile, the chief priests and the other religious leaders stood there shouting their accusations. Now Herod and his soldiers began mocking and ridiculing Jesus and putting a kingly robe on him. They sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate, enemies before, became fast friends. Number six, Jesus is then returned to Pilate. Pilate makes a feeble attempt to release Jesus. In Luke's gospel, Pilate even renders a verdict. The verdict that he renders? Not guilty. In Luke 23, verse 14, at the end of the verse, it says, Having examined him in your presence, I find no fault in this. And concerning those things of which you 
accuse him, unquote. How many of you have ever gone to court? You don't have to say why, you've just been there. Have you ever heard of a court case where the judge finds you not guilty and then punishes you? This section of Matthew's gospel records the events of the grand jury. This section examines those things that are going to take place just prior to chapter 27, verse 1. And again, for purposes of our study, we're going to look at the key figures in the trial. In this portion, we're going to see two witnesses, two trials, two judges. Who are the two witnesses? Well, again, in broad terms, one of the witnesses is going to be on the outside, reluctant, but he knows the truth about the identity of Jesus. This is none other than our friend Simon Peter, who follows Jesus from a distance in verse 58. The other set of the witnesses are the false witnesses on the inside. These are the best false witnesses that money can buy. The second, there are two trials. One is taking place here on the planet Earth. Jesus is unfairly condemned. But even as this physical and visible trial is taking place on the Earth, there is an invisible, eternal trial that's taking place in heaven. There are two judges one here on the earth asking the right question, but not willing to accept the right answer. The other is in heaven, the eternal judge, who is going to dispense justice in the future with absolute fairness in verse 64. So again, look at verse 57. Look what it says. It says, um, and those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Now, before we look at the timid witness, Simon Peter, I just want to just for a brief moment look at the judge and look at the jury. We know from John chapter 18, verse 13, that Jesus, again, goes to Annas for an initial examination. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. And some people are, are, are confused. They go, well, well, is Annas the high priest or is Caiaphas the high priest? Well, in a real sense, both of them are, like a Supreme Court justice, you hold the office for life and you retain the title even when you leave office. I was reading this morning that George H.W. Bush and his wife Barbara are now have, have the longest lasting marriage of any United States president in the history of our country. We still refer to President Bush as President Bush or President Clinton or President Obama. President retains the title for life. And in this culture and society, the high priest would, be, would retain the title even if they're not functioning in the official role of the high priest. So in the Jewish Sanhedrin, let me help you understand, there were 23 priests. There were 23 scribes. And when you hear that word scribe, think attorney. Not just a person who records information, but these are skilled individuals who are adept at understanding and applying the law. And then there are 23 elders who represent the people of Israel on the council. So there are two officers of the court, one of them being the high priest. They're supposed to re represent the religious, the legal, and then the democratic aspects of, of rule in Israel. And so in our culture and society, we have a president and we have a legislature and we have a Supreme Court. In this culture and society, the Sanhedrin comprised the legal ruling entity for the Jewish people. 
So again, because they're supposed to represent the religious, the legal, and the democratic aspects of Israel, to sit on the Sanhedrin, a person had to be what was known as a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Paul talks about that when he says, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. It's an idiomatic expression, which means I'm Jewish on both sides of my family and can trace the genealogy on both sides of the family. The other thing is the person had to be a Hebrew of the Hebrews. They had to be learned in the law and they had to be linguistically adept. By that, I mean they had to be proficient in multiple languages. So in this particular instance, they had to be proficient in Aramaic. They would have had to been proficient in Hebrew. They would have had to be proficient in Greek and almost certainly in Latin. And so again, all of these, not for the reasons you might, might understand, but they have to be proficient in the languages so that they can hear testimony, so they can hear and understand the testimony and then draw conclusions. They were supposed to be just and humble and fair-minded. They had to have not known to accept bribes. If a person was a relative or if a person stood to gain by a guilty verdict, individuals were to recuse themselves from participation. And some have wondered, well, where's Joseph of Arimathea in all of this? He's a member of the Sanhedrin. Where's Nicodemus in all of this? We don't actually know the answer. One of two things is happening. This is a kangaroo court where not everyone is present or these two men may or may not have had to recuse themselves because of their intimacy or their relationship. Almost certainly, maybe it wasn't a recuse, a recusal of themselves, because at this point, it could be that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus are still very much secret followers of Jesus. And so again, in verse 58, it says, but Peter follows him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. And he went in and he sat with the servants to see the end. Again, this is an expression which means he's following at a distance. He's going to sneak into the servants' quarters so that he can evaluate and see how all of this is going to turn out. So our players at the trial include religious leaders. But now we find the timid witness, Peter, following from a distance until he makes it to the outer courtyard and he sits in among the servants. And a little later, we're going to see how this is going to lead to Peter's famous denials in verses 69 through 75. He is sitting outside by the fire with the servants. Now, again, I want you to think about what's happening because a line of witnesses are coming in to testify against Jesus, but this would have been the perfect opportunity for Peter to testify for Jesus. Here's the question. Does Peter know the truth about Jesus' innocence, about his identity, and about his mission. So Peter sits by the fire. He attempts to blend in so that he can see what's happening to Jesus. And what's the reason, again, for, for him following at a distance? The most obvious reason is Peter doesn't want to be identified with or caught by the authorities in his friendship and fellowship with Jesus. And in just a little while, he's going to deny even knowing Jesus. And it's going to prove to be the biggest mistake of his life. Let me ask you a question. What's the biggest mistake of your life? You don't have to shout it out. We don't need to know. But I want you to just ponder for a moment and, and think about that question. What's the biggest mistake of your life? Was it from 
following Jesus from a distance or not at all. In other words, were the circumstances surrounding the decisions that you made, was it because, well, guess what? Jesus really wasn't a part of your life. He really wasn't a part of your love. He wasn't really a part of who you were and what you did. And, and so all of this to say, was it from following Jesus from a distance or not at all? You can't hold out long if for whatever reason you decide to follow Jesus in your own strength and with your own wisdom and at a distance. Look, I'm going to be a Christ follower, but you know, I'll go to church, I'll own a Bible, I'll crack it open every once in a while. I don't want to be a Jesus freak. What will people think if they discover I'm a Jesus freak? Here's the whole point. We know from our previous studies that Peter starts his journey with Jesus with great confidence and self-assurance, much like some of you. Peter thinks that he could allow and he can follow in his own confidence and he can follow in his own power and he can follow in his own will. His self-confidence is going to eventually lead to a lack of prayer and then a lack of devotion in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, he's sleeping when he should have been praying and now instead of charging in there and being a bold witness for Jesus... He's warming himself on the outside by the fires of the enemy. Inside, in just a few minutes, people are going to be bearing false witness in an attempt to lead the leadership of Israel astray. Outside, Peter will not only bear false witness, he's going to ultimately deny the Lord. Most people don't really fall away from Jesus in some grand display of disobedience and rebellion. You don't usually just wake up one morning and you go, you know what, I'm going to close my Bible and I'm going to stop reading my Bible and I'm going to stop fellowshipping with Christians and I'm going to stop hanging out and I'm going to stop doing all of that stuff. Usually there's a gradual, residual, incremental distancing yourself. We become inconsistent with the Lord in our, in, in our personal devotion, in our prayer, in our Bible reading. We would rather go to the movies than go to church. We'd rather have fellowship with darkness than with light. And then we find ourselves in participation, not with Christ, but with the things of the world. And then we stumble. And then we fall. And we're going to get up or we're going to stay down. And if you're sitting down with the people of the world, warming yourself at their fire, trying to find comfort and warmth and security in their fellowship, guess what? Beware, because denial is only a few short sentences away. And look what it says in verses 59 through 69. Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death but found none, even though many false witnesses came forward. They found none, but at, at last two witnesses came forward and said, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Now think about what you're reading. The religious leaders began searching for testimony against Jesus. I've repeatedly told you that there are three things that you have to have in order to be a good witness. Number one, you have to have a knowledge of the facts. Number two, you have to have a reputation for honesty. And number three, you have to be prepared to tell the truth. The witnesses in a Jewish trial were very important. Many of you may have been called as a witness in some sort of case or trial or proceeding. In our system, a person testifies 
to the court where you have a judge, you have a defense attorney, and you have a prosecuting attorney. In, in the Jewish judicial system of the first century, the witness serves a, a, a very different role. The witness is also the accuser. I want you to understand that. The witness also serves as the accuser. And so in verse 59, they're seeking people who will accuse Jesus of capital crimes. They have to find two people willing to make the same accusation against Jesus of some crime that's worthy of death. And this would have been extremely difficult. Why is this extremely difficult? Remember what the Bible's testimony is concerning Jesus. He is a sinless man. Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus isn't a sinner. He doesn't sin. He's not guilty of anything. Now remember, in their judicial system, the testimony of the witnesses had to match exactly. The Sanhedrin needed two witnesses. And the people who volunteered to witness, if they were caught lying, were themselves subject to punishment. So imagine in our court system, if you accuse a person of a capital crime, and it's not the truth, and it's discovered that you're lying or you're perjuring yourself, you could be put to death. Or if you accuse someone of stealing, or if you accuse someone of whatever it happens to be, whatever the crime that was appropriate, you would have to bear the punishment. And so, again, you had to be a qualified witness. Women and children were disqualified. Gentiles were never qualified. Women couldn't participate in capital cases because the Jewish leaders didn't believe that women would have the stomach, if you will, to go through the process of capital punishment because remember, the witness stands as the accuser and so they have to be the first ones to pick up the stone and cast it at the accused. So Jews felt that women may not be willing to go through with the stoning. A mentally incompetent or a morally unfit person couldn't testify. And so in verse 60, it says, finally, at last, two witnesses came forward. Now, remember that all the witnesses had to be in full agreement concerning the details of the crime. And this is why they were having a tough time finding false witnesses. One expert on Jewish law has written, quote, even where there appeared a, le a number or a legal number of duly qualified witnesses, the testimony was insufficient to convict unless they agreed not only with regard to the prisoner's offense, but also with regard to the mode or the manner in which they committed it. Rabbinic law does not subject a person to capital or even corporal punishment unless all witnesses charge him with one and the same criminal act their statements fully agreeing in the main circumstances and declaring that they saw one another while seeing him engaged in the crime. So think about this. You have to have one person and another person. They both have to see the same thing and then say the same thing and then both of the people who are bringing the accusation have to also be willing to swear that they saw one another at the scene of the crime. And again, this comes from Numbers chapter 35, verse 30, where it says, whoever is deserving of death shall be put to, to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. It shall, he shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Pause. In other words, in this judicial system, if only one person saw you commit a capital crime, the chances were very good that you were going to get away with it. The hands, it says in Numbers 35, 30, the hands of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death. And afterward, the hands of the people. In other words, the law requires that those making the accusation have to be willing 
to execute the punishment. And the Lord says, so you shall put away the evil from among you. The net result, people convicted, convicted of capital crimes is very, very rare in this culture. And so in verse 61, look what it says. They testify, the, this fellow says, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. Did Jesus really say that? What's the, the right answer? No. You'll recall the story is from John chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus did say, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The text says he was speaking of his own body. He didn't say, I will destroy this man-made temple. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What's he talking about? His body. He's in effect saying, kill me and I'll come back to life. It was the first Passover. It was two years earlier. And by the way, this is exactly what false witnesses still do. They'll take something that Jesus says and then they'll twist it to suit their own circumstances. They take the words of Jesus and then torture the text until it screams and says what they want it to say instead of what it actually says. In this great trial, the accusers of Jesus have heard him make the statements about the temple. Again, was it really the holy temple of God that he's threatening? No, because to destroy the holy temple in Jerusalem was in fact a capital crime. It would be like if someone said, I'm going to blow up the capital of the United States. I'm going to blow up the Supreme Court. I am going to blow up the White House. Do you think that the lawmakers are going to get upset if there is a credible belief that someone says, I'm going to destroy the seats of government, and then they have the, the, the way of actually doing it? Now, but, so think about that in terms of what happened on 9-11, when people took planes and then they drove it into the Twin Towers. And many of you realize that one of those planes was, mar one was, was headed for the Pentagon. One of those planes was headed either for the Capitol building or the White House building. What do they want to do? They want to destroy the seat of government. Why did our enemies want to destroy the seat of government? Because they want to destroy you. They want to destroy your life. And so you, you can give false witnesses, you, you, you can give false witnesses witness by giving right information with the wrong implication. And so this is exactly what these witnesses are, do, are doing. So Jeremiah the prophet had been accused of, of threatening the temple. Are there false witnesses and scripture twisters still with us? The answer is, of course they are. They bring shame on themselves by deceiving others, and they're going to suffer the penalty of their misdeeds. And so, again, it isn't just as simple as someone saying, well, they're just wrong about God, or they're just wrong about Jesus, or they're just wrong about salvation. Well, guess what? When you're wrong about God and you're wrong about Jesus and you're wrong about salvation, think about how high the stakes are. And so think about the two trials between verses 62 and 63. The high priest arises, he says, do you not answer nothing? What is these that the men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. The old King James, I love it, what it says. I adjure thee by the living God. In other words, I'm calling on you to tell the truth. As the high priest of Israel, I demand that you tell us the truth. Now, I find it interesting that Jesus didn't defend himself when the scripture twisters perverted the teaching. I find it interesting that when they misrepresented him and misrepresented his words, Jesus kept silent. An accused person in Jewish law 
was never compelled to testify against himself. In our culture, you, you, you've heard people say, you have the right to remain silent. One of the legal benefits of being a United States citizen is you can't be compelled to testify against yourself. Jesus was within his rights and the law to remain silent. In Jewish law, you could not be made to testify against yourself. Jesus was speaking in part by his silence. The very fact that he is silent, he is in effect saying, if you're going to try me, at least try me according to the word of God. In our culture and society, someone might say, why are you silent? If you were, if you were innocent, then you would have something to say. Don't let anyone ever fool you. You have the right to remain silent. My advice always is remain silent until your attorney shows up. Why? Because here's what you get to say. No, you, you know what? If you're going to accuse me and find me guilty, then you're going to have to try me according to the law of the land. Jesus is in effect saying, if you're going to try me, do it according to the word of God. Do it according to, to what the word of God says concerning the accusation and the evidence. But you do, do you remember what the Old Testament says? Like a lamb is silent before its shearers. He opened not his mouth before his accusers. Now, again, think about this. There are really two ultimate trials taking place that day. One is taking place on the earth with Caiaphas. One is taking place in heaven. One is just. The other is unjust. The trial of Jesus is not fair. Several rules that govern arrest and trial were violated by the accusers of Jesus. Number one, the arrest of Jesus took place at night. According to the Jewish law, they had an established and inflexible rule that capital cases could never take place at night. According to the Mishnah, quote, let a capital case be tried during the day, but suspended at night, unquote. That wasn't done. Number two, the arrest was achieved through the agency of a traitor. The law that bears on that role of Judas as traitor is found in Leviticus 19.16, which says, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people, neither shalt thou against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. This means that the accuser has to be of good character and that the accuser cannot bear witness against a close companion, against a friend, against a relative. In other words, a companion or a friendship or a relative couldn't be compelled to testify. Number three, the high priest was forbidden to speak during an inquiry. The high priest's opinion was so valued that he was always the last person to vote. In deep frustration, the high priest breaks that rule. The false witnesses couldn't even bring a proper accusation. And so the high priest could not lawfully elicit a confession from a prisoner. The Jewish law assumed that people had a right not to incriminate themselves. The Jewish assembly typically met in a semicircle so that everyone could see everyone else. And when it came time to cast the vote, each person had to indicate their vote one at a time. That wasn't done. The mob just simply cried out. Also, when the high priest got up, he assumes the role of accuser and judge. Again, the Mishnah says, be not a sole judge, for there is no sole judge but one. And number four, there was no indictment. There's no formal charge. That too was illegal. Again, how can you have a trial with no charges? And so in verse 63, when the high priest says, I put you under oath, or I adjure you by the living God, tell me if you're the Christ, the Son of God. This is a brilliant but illegal question on the part of the high priest. It is, in fact, the right question. Because if he had said, do you claim to be the Messiah, all charges would have to be dropped. Do you want to know why? Why? Because there's no law that states 
thou shalt not claim to be the Messiah. By the way, if the real Messiah shows up, doesn't the real Messiah have the right to claim to be the Messiah? So there's no law against claiming to be the Messiah. If the high priest had said, do you claim to be the son of God? Well, guess what? The charges would have to be dropped. For all Jews believed that they were sons of God in a unique and protected sense of being a special people to God. Here, the high priest is demanding that Jesus reveal whether he is the Messiah and the holy, unique, prophesied son of the blessed. Are you the one who is revealed to us by the law and the prophets? That's the right question. But he was unprepared for the answer. Earlier, Peter had said, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. The high priest asked the question. But he refuses to accept the fact that Jesus is who he claims to be. And he doesn't even ask whether or not he has credentials to prove these claims. How are people any different today? Jesus claims to be the unique the powerful, the holy, the awesome God. Jesus claims to be the person who loves you, who can forgive your sin, who can reconcile you to the Father. Jesus claims to be the one who created you. Jesus claims to be the one who created the heavens and the earth and the whole unfolding drama of human history. Jesus claims to be the one to be the satisfying solution to the problem of sin so that you can have your sins forgiven so that you can be reconciled to God so that you can eventually go to heaven. It's interesting to me that the news media is willing to ask, who are you, Jesus? Hinduism is willing to ask, who are you, Jesus? Islam is willing to ask, who are you, Jesus? Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and Christian scientists and Unitarians all ask the question, who are you? But they're unprepared for the answer that Jesus offers. Look what it says in verse 64. It is as you said. Do you know what that means? Bluntly, simply, yes. For my Spanish-speaking friends, si. For my French-speaking friends, we. Oui. Yes. Jesus utters, I am. And if that's not enough... Jesus makes reference to, this, to the book of Psalms and the book of David. In Psalm 110 verse 1 it says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Who was sitting on the right hand of God? Messiah. He's the Lord. Jesus is saying, the next time you see me, you'll see me sitting at the right hand of power next to my Father, the person that you claim is your God. The next reference is Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. This is Daniel's blatant statement of identity. Two messianic scriptures about Jesus. Jesus is giving them one last chance, a final warning. Think about what he's saying. I am the one who is in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. I am the one who's coming back to judge the living and the dead. You think you're judging me, but I will judge you. The roles will one day be re reversed. Even in this statement, Jesus is inviting them to repent and to accept his identity. Or at the very least, consider his claims. And each and every one of you, without exception, weighs the evidence concerning the identity and the mission of Jesus. Right now, you're, you might be in the process of going, I wonder if Jesus really is who he says he is. I, I wonder if he really is the Christ. I, I wonder if he is, like the Bible says, God 
among us. I wonder if everything that the Bible says concerning his life and his death and his teachings and his resurrection and his ascension into heaven, I wonder if what he says about himself is true. And by claiming to be the Messiah, he's claiming to have rights over you. He's making the claim, I made you. I created you. If you've ever, ever, in, ever in your life, ever in the quietness of your bedroom with tears streaming down your face, if you've ever said, why am I here? What am I doing here? What in the, what in the world? Why did you make me? The answer is found in the Bible. He made you so that, so that you could have a relationship with him, so that you could love him and know him. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so in verse 65, the high priest tears his garment. Jesus answers with courage. Jesus knows that his statement is going to persuade the assembly to do what they have to do, to believe him, or to reject him. By the way, do you think Jesus knew that his answer would infuriate them? You see, there's only really one suitable defense. He is the Messiah, or he isn't. If he wasn't the Messiah, then the religious leaders had every right to protect the people against a pretender and a fraud. But if he's not a pretender and a fraud, if he really is who he says he, he is, then you have to believe him. Now think about what's happening. Jesus is accused of saying something so offensive that it wounds the dignity or the identity or the character of God. That's what he's charged with now. Blasphemy of saying something so repulsive, so inconsistent with the dignity and the identity and the character of God that to allow him to live would be an offense against God. And I think that the irony isn't lost. The high priest is standing before God, accusing God of claiming to be God. In verses 66 and 67, it says they spat in his face and they beat him and they struck him with the palms of their hands. Mark's gospel says they blindfolded him and beat him. The word beat, by the way, is a specific word in the original language, which means to hit with a closed fist. In an act of mob violence, they rush him and they beat him and temple soldiers cover his face and they begin to torture him. 700 years before this event, the prophet Isaiah had a horrifying vision of what took place. It says, quote, his visage was marred more than any man, unquote. The margin in my Bible reads, the literal rending is terrible. So marred from the form of man was his aspect that his appearance was not even that of a human. I want you to think of a person who's in a car accident. They're not wearing their seatbelt. They're hit at 60 miles an hour and their face goes through the front of the windshield and they land on the pavement and their face becomes so swollen that you can't even imagine that this is a human being. These are the effects of a brutal beating. Jesus is going to take their punishment. He's not going to refuse their blows. And I think it's easy for us to forget that Jesus could have easily destroyed his tormentors. But he doesn't. Mark's gospel adds in Mark 14, 64, you've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Again, this is illegal under Jewish law. Unlike our law, and this is irony, in the Jewish culture, if there's a unanimous decision by the council towards the accused, he was set free. 
Do you want to know why? Because in Jewish law, unlike our law, in Jewish law, a unanimous decision would indicate the presence of no mercy. In order to avoid mob rule, they exonerated a person and let him go if there was complete unanimity for a person to have no friend, no advocate, no defense. Seemed harsh and cruel. And again, this may seem strange to us. Hebrew law insisted on mercy and to avoid rash and harsh judgments. The rule of unanimity ensured that the court would act decently. But again, they throw out the rules when it comes to Jesus. And you know what amazes me? Jesus isn't sentenced to death under a cruel, barbaric, primitive legal system. Jesus is tried under a legal system that's filled with fairness and generosity. But human beings' hearts are so wicked and evil that they can corrupt any system, no matter how fair, no matter how enlightened. These religious leaders broke their own rules to arrest him and then to arraign him and then to convict him. And you may think that that's unfair. But think about how many people are unwilling to really give Jesus a chance. Tell me who you are. Tell me what you want. What does the Bible really say? What is Jesus asking me to do? In verse 64, Jesus reminds his accusers. Right now, you think you're the judge. In verse 64, Jesus is in fact admitting that he's the judge. An irony of ironies, there's also another witness. Jesus. Jesus is the witness of God's love. Jesus is the testimony of God's love towards you. Jesus isn't like our timid witness, Peter. Jesus can be trusted. And unlike the false and unfair witnesses, we know that what he has to say is true. And one day, he will evaluate you. And he won't make a mistake. No one will be able to say to Jesus, unjust, untrue. No one will be able to say to Jesus, did you take this into consideration? Did you understand this? Jesus is going to preside as judge and witness. And every person will experience a cosmic trial to determine their eternal destiny when Jesus died on the cross, the cosmic court went into session in Colossians 2, 13 and 14 and says, And you being dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. According to the Bible, whatever you're guilty of, eternally and invisibly, Jesus wrote it down and had it placed on the cross of Calvary. So that whatever you're guilty of, whatever you stand guilty of, Jesus offers forgiveness. And those who reject Jesus and his cross must of necessity stand on their own. And they invite God to judge them on the presence or the absence of their own sin. So one of two things is real. Either you'll accept the trial of the cross or you'll stand before your maker on your own. You'll accept the death of Jesus on the cross 
or you'll embrace his witness in heaven. By the way, are you willing to accept justice from the judge? Or are you willing to accept mercy from the judge? Christian, never, ever, ever ask for justice. It's not what you want. You want mercy. And by the way, that's the eternal choice. Jesus or justice. No one in their right mind would ask for justice. Malcolm Muggridge, the great English writer in his book, Jesus, the man who lives, said about justice, quote, another of the world's great fantasies. To call for justice in this world, which Jesus never once did, nor did he at any point give any indication of expecting justice, or in any of his reported utterances so much as mention the word, amounts in practice to be calling for something which by its nature cannot be just vis-a-vis the law, unquote. What Muggridge is saying is that to appeal to justice is to appeal to the law. And of course, Paul says, how many people are saved by the law? Zero. And how many are saved by Christ? All who come to him. All who in humility and confidence who come to him and believe in him. The Bible says, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord. Can the law save you? No. Can the law save the innocent? You would hope so. You would hope that our judicial system would render a not guilty verdict for those who are not guilty. But even the most enlightened judicial systems that the earth has ever seen can be corrupted. The Jewish system didn't save Jesus from a cruel cross. And to cry out for justice in human terms is as foolish as crying out for iced water in the Sahara Desert. For men, we can look for mercy and pity And thanks to Jesus, we also can look for mercy and pity and forgiveness. We will make one of those two cries. You will ask for Jesus or you will ask for justice. We're going to have communion now and I'm going to have the... uh, the, the, uh, the worship team come up, but let me just pray for you quickly and and we're going to have communion. Go ahead and open up the elements. Heavenly Father, I pray now again for these men and women. Lord, just a few hours before this horrific arraignment and kangaroo court and awful judgment, Jesus is found guilty of crimes that he never committed. He's accused of calling himself the Messiah and he's found guilty of the claim, but the claim, of course, is either true or false. And Lord, we believe that it's true. We believe that a real Jesus lived and died on a real cross and suffered. Just like the the Bible says that on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take this and eat it, all of you. This is my body which will be broken for you. And again, the Bible says he took the cup, he gave thanks and praise, and he said, take this and drink it, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new and the everlasting covenant, which would be shed for the forgiveness of sins. And Lord, by taking this bread and drinking this cup, we're identifying ourselves as Jesus followers, as Jesus lovers, as Jesus believers in the sacrifice of Jesus, that his sacrifice is going to provide for us the remedy that we need in order to experience cleansing of our conscience, forgiveness of our sins, and reconciliation with you. 
And so, Lord, in faith, just like we received you by faith and we believe you by faith, in faith we believe that taking these elements will once, once again constitute a witness that we're testifying before heaven and our fellow human beings, our believing friends, that I love Jesus. I'm a Jesus follower. I believe in his sacrifice. I believe that his death satisfies my sin and that he rose from the dead and that he's alive right now and that he can change me. And so I take these elements freely, acknowledging and believing that they represent what Jesus has done for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and partake.